Okay. Welcome everyone to this uh, OS Auction Academy number eight. Uh, this Auction Academy will be an online debate between uh, four, maybe five panelists. Um, it's uh, Catherine Mitchell from Exeter. It's uh, Fabian Regan from Ecofis. Mario Rakic from uh, from Fraunhofer and Lena Kitzing from uh, Te the Technical University of Denmark (TCU). And uh, if we have any luck, we will have uh, Juan Fevier with us from uh, Ipatola as well. Um, well, uh, we will start up with uh, a few questions to each of the panelists and after that uh, maybe the first 15-20 minutes you will all participants will get the chance to comment or raise questions to the panelists um, and you can do that by raising your hands in the system uh, you can find the buttons on the right side of the screen uh, to do that and uh, when you raise your hand I will uh, give you the words uh, when we come to that. You can also, as an alternative, write your questions in the chat and we will uh, read them out there. And uh, please write and uh, state who you're directing your question to uh, when we come to that. Um, well, Good. Let's uh, start with a question for Catherine, um, just to get it all going. Uh, Catherine, what, what do you think are the most significant pros and cons of auctions for renewable energy compared with other European support systems? Um, well, I, I think that it's uh, very uh, hard to make a kind of black and white, you know, this is good and that's bad, because every mechanism comes down to its details, and um, there will also be a difference if you, um, if there are other mechanisms in place at the same time in support of renewables, or whether an auction is the only uh, thing there, the only mechanism there, and it will make a difference um, depending on the situation of the country, and it will also make a difference to the type of um, renewables that are being auctioned. For example, whether it's sort of large-scale offshore wind or uh, small-scale PV. So, um, you know, with all the kind of provisos about all the things to do with details, um, thought about first of all, but. I think if you were a country starting out in or early on in the development of um, renewables, a sort of classic risk-free fit is far preferable to auctions. Um, as I say, that's not to say that one should go one way or the other, but just generally if you're starting out, I would um, argue that's um, the case. So with a with a kind of classic fit, um, there's you know zero to minimal risk for investors. Uh, it attracts a diverse set of actors, a diverse set of technologies, um, a diverse set of sizes. It's administratively simple. It doesn't have to be um, any more expensive, and importantly, it attracts um, mentors. Really. Uh, the on the other on the other side, and that's just great to kind of get capacity going. Um, if if governments don't you know only have a certain amount of money, then often they don't really like having uh, fits because they can't control how much they're going to spend in any one year. But the problem with auctions is if you don't have very much money, then they can become very competitive. And that, that can mean that you end up with either larger projects or larger developers, and it excludes uh, smaller projects. And this, you know, obviously, you can you can try to put in um, different details to improve them, but yeah, you know, just in terribly general senses. Uh, 
So with a small pot of money, they can become competitive, that can lead to large sizes, that can lead to large, large developers. Um, you absolutely have to have penalties with auctions. If you don't have penalties, then actors can start to game. But if you do have penalties, again, that is often not so good for smaller players. Um, in general auctions, you know, favours a few winners rather than developing this sort of group of um, mentors and the process can be um, ad administratively complex. So when when you're starting out or when you're just trying to get capacity going, I think that, that fits are um, simpler and I would support that. If you get into a situation where you are a country which has got a lot of capacity and you are um, trying to uh, move from just developing a bit of some renewables into an energy system which is based on renewables, then I think different issues pertain. But it's always, always important that a, a country has a mechanism which supports the very small scale or domestic level or communities because in a way that's often the lifeblood of a kind of an attitude within a society towards progression of an energy system. And it's always important to keep that. So I think in general you really, even if you kind of go into a system that has auctions which might favour larger scale, you always need to kind of keep something which is um, going to be able to support smaller stuff. And that, that, that's probably the easiest way to do that is a bit. Okay, thank you. Uh, and then a question for Fabian, as author, author of the recently published uh, country reports of the ORIS uh, project. Uh, is it possible for you to give any general recommendation on uh, auction designs on the basis of the experience in uh, other countries so far? Um, yes, thank you. I mean, interesting development because so far, most of experiences on auctions have so far mostly been based on developing countries. Europe has made this experience rather late on auction design. And however, recently we see that more and more European countries introduced auctions, either because they want to achieve more volume control and, and or more budget control over the build of an auction, they want to introduce competitive elements, or they are simply being forced to do so by the EU state guidelines. So now, step by step, we also also can already um, take into account experiences from France, from the UK, the Netherlands, um, increasingly Germany, Spain has just started an auction, etc. So there's already something to work with. The difficulty is that um, since auctions take place usually quite early in, in the project development uh, stage, there's it's so far not possible to evaluate all the auction schemes on the actual effectiveness. So we cannot really say whether in all auction schemes projects have already been realized because simply they, the, the realization time is still ongoing for many, in many cases. What we can learn so far is that um, countries really try to tailor their individual auction scheme towards the, the local market conditions. So for example, the level of competition and to the, the national um, policy goals, which might differ. So some countries might want to uh, put the focus rather on reducing uh, the costs, so they, are, they really want to introduce many, many competitive elements in, in the auction. Others uh, put a high priority on, on um, target performance and, and, and monitoring, and then they might put their focus rather on, on the radiation rates. Um, what we can do so far, still, we can see that, that um, in terms of effect effectiveness, efficiency, and um, maybe also actor diversity, um, some general good practices can 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 be be learned already. Um, for effectiveness, and that's something that Catherine Mitchell already pointed out, it's really really important to have uh, penalties in place. Um, I think the UK NFO would be an example where these penalties had not been in place, and therefore very few projects were being realised. You have to take into account that penalties also always increase the the risk. Uh, for the project developers and thereby could also increase risk premiums and prices. So the, the delicate uh, measuring and balancing of ensuring project realization on one hand, on the other hand, uh, ensuring that projects don't become too expensive. Um, 
the question then is, of course, should, should, there be, should there be differentiation in terms of, of, of penalties? So, for example, should there be for non-fault based um, project delays, should there be an exemption? And uh, experiences, for example, in Brazil show that this is very difficult to, to truly monitor and would uh, often give good reason to, to, to um, yeah, misuse of the scheme. So this has to be further watched, I think. Another key issue on the effectiveness of projects is um, whether material pre-qualification requirements should be introduced. So whether the projects should, that are bidding um, should have already progressed in a certain way that they uh, have, put, for example, already secured a, a, a permit. Um, or good connection, etc. And then that often can be an advantage because then the if this has been secured already, the, the chance that the projects are being realized is much higher. And we see that in Europe most countries have introduced such material pre qualification requirements as well. In terms of efficiency as how to bring down costs, um, we can learn that you know, on the one hand low transaction costs are very important. So the more complex the system is, the more complex the reporting requirements are, the more bidders might be Drove out, might be deterred, or might simply not participate at all. So that's something to keep in mind. Of course, balancing uh, the risks um, is important. And uh, experience here from Denmark shows that if you have uh, projects that have a very, a very high risk in the beginning, for example, offshore projects, it could make sense to have part of it pre developed by the state to take out some of the risk for the project developer. Um, it's important to uh, reduce uh, unwanted strategic bidding. For example, we had a situation in China where um, state-owned enterprises were underbidding other private actors to drive them out from the market and therefore reduce competition later on. So that's something to watch for. And then in the end, the issue of actor diversity. So as Catherine already mentioned, is our small actors do they still have an opportunity to participate in an auction? Um, we assume actually that that from from they're not necessarily, these projects are not necessarily much more expensive um, than the large projects, um, but uh, they, uh, small vectors might not be able to spread the risk that well because they don't have such a large portfolio. And then indeed the question is, should they be exempted from office at all and should they get access to feed tariff or to another scheme or should they get preferential, ex uh, preferential treatment within the auction? And then, um, we soon uh, reach issues of, 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 well, how to differentiate them between the actors who should get this preferential treatment or how to ensure the project has been realized if they get preferential treatment. So that's a whole new debate, and I think we should also, in the course of the discussion today, still focus on that. But in that case, experiences in Europe are still very limited. In, in, in developing countries, you can see that many, many countries chose to specifically support domestic component manufacturers or on the domestic um, project developers. In Europe, this is uh, experience is still limited. In Germany, we have a discussion right now on the role of small actors, and that's to be watched. Um, so yeah, maybe to, to, to conclude, um, difficult to really uh, make very succinct uh, statements already on efficiency and effectiveness, but we can see already that some types of, of yeah, design elements seem to have worked already. Okay, good, interesting, thank you. And uh, now we move on to uh, Mario. Um, what what can you say about the effects of on, on prices so far? Uh, are auctions making the establishment of renewables any cheaper? In Thanks. Yeah, your I think research. As uh, the typical answer, it depends, and answers are ambiguous. Uh, in some cases, we have seen. Uh, increasing efficiency or re reduction of prices, and in other cases, uh, even uh, an increase of support levels, uh, remuneration levels. And uh, generally, one has to say that experiences with auctions, in particular in Europe, are very young, and but also in uh, larger developing country markets, uh, experiences are recent, and so um, the only limited. Uh, statements about the level of remuneration can be made. But maybe first, uh, in terms of a conceptual um, aspect, one should uh, mention that uh, auctions lead to a different product, uh, whereas a, a administratively designed feed in tariff gives the option to develop renewable projects and uh, the option to um, yeah, build capacity 
an auction is an obligation to build the capacity, and therefore it gives a better certainty from the point of the regulator, and uh, this obligation comes with a risk because we, you can only enforce the obligation if you in, implement a penalty, as Catherine Mitchell uh, rightly said. So penalties are always mandatory, and therefore they involve a risk, and therefore uh, the, the fact that an auction is an obligation uh, can lead to the fact that systematically costs might increase. On the other hand, an auction is a competitive support scheme, and therefore you have competitive forces within the market, which should lead to a cost re or price reduction reducing uh, effect. And therefore, uh, essentially these two effects are balancing each other, increasing risk and uh, increasing um, competition. And therefore, uh, the, the fact whether the level of remuneration would increase or decrease depends also a lot on how the auction is designed in terms of whether effectiveness is put in the focus, as for example uh, the auctioning design in Germany is uh, planned, or whether efficiency is uh, the major focus as uh, in the current Dutch um, auction design. Uh, and now I come to some cases uh, where we empirically try to assess the effect on remuneration levels. Uh, first of all, like first, first example for, for wind energy, I think we have seen uh, very competitive prices, for example, in Brazil. We have seen clearly a price reduction uh, from the former feed-in tariffs uh, to the auctioning scheme. Uh, pri prices dropped sometimes even really dramatically by uh, a factor of two, but then uh, it seems there was also some winner's curse uh, included. So, um, actually, uh, we had seen bits below uh, actual costs, and uh, the market has realized that, and therefore prices uh, in, the dip, in, in recent auction, auctioning rounds have increased again in Brazil, and uh, the current prices are at a similar level as the former feed-in tariffs. So at least for Brazil, one can say that uh, prices didn't increase. Uh, a similar, let's say, positive experience was it could be made in uh, Italy for wind energy, where uh, formerly we had a quota obligation and uh, really relatively high prices, and the current auctioning results lead to still relatively high prices, but lower than the quota uh, system, lower prices than the quota system. Uh, in other countries, we had also seen uh, increasing prices. Um, so, as I said, it's, it's ambiguous. Uh, then, then for PV, uh, it's very difficult to actually evaluate the effect of auctioning on the price level um, due to the fact that we have this, seen this very strong uh, cost dynamics uh, of PV technology uh, where uh, it is hard to differentiate whether any price reduction is actually based on the technology learning and the cost reduction of the technology or on based on the effect of the support scheme. Um, so uh, essentially we couldn't, like in France or um, uh, also in South Africa, uh, it's, it's difficult to uh, measure or to see really a price redu reducing effect. In the recent uh, German auctions for PV, at least we could, can say that we haven't seen an increase in prices. Uh, we have become very competitive uh, bits uh, of about nine cents per kilowatt hour, and this is rel relatively similar to the results of the former uh, feed-in tariff. So uh, generally, I, I would say for for PV, um, the results are um, also um, rather rather positive. Um, biomass would be the third technology, and here um, I have to say that, that the <laughs> results are uh, more ambiguous. We have seen increasing prices uh, in a number of markets, um, and in France, which uh, has auctioned uh, biomass in parallel to the feed-in tariff, we had seen similar results. Uh, the level of remuneration was uh, similar from the auctioning as from the feed-in tariff. That would be my uh, short empirical summary of uh, some auctioning results in, in recent uh, international auctions. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, we don't have uh, one with us yet, so um, let's move on to uh, Lena. 
And uh, my question to you as the project coordinator of the hours project, uh, what are the one or two most interesting or surprising findings in the research of the project so far? Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, maybe just um, as a short start, um, the ORIS project has been running for a little bit over a year now. And what we do in the ORIS project is um, we combine some uh, theoretic ana theoretical analysis, empirical analysis with um, workshops and stakeholder dialogue and uh, bilateral meetings. And we're also going to do some auction experiments. So there's quite a big <coughs> uh, a range of activities that we are going to do. And um, I will just share a couple of uh, insights with you that we had um, during this first year of, uh, of the work. Um, for example, from the uh, theor theoretical analysis, I think we can see that um, it is very helpful in understanding some general um, relations between uh, different designs. For example, um, the pricing rule, uh, if we take um, un uniform pricing and pays bit pricing rule, um, um, when we do uh, mathemat mathematical formulations uh, to calculate this, we see that um, in the uniform pricing uh, rule, there is actually a weekly dominant strategy to bid true costs, um, which we don't have in the payers bid. Uh, there is a, um, an incentive to, to bid a little add-on, and I think um, Mario uh, has already uh, uh, um, mentioned that or uh, hinted towards this. And um, this is why in the literature, when we look into this, uh, the auction literature, we, always, uh, we see often that there is uh, some, preference, uh, some preference towards the uniform pricing rule. But when we look into uh, real life experiences, uh, this is not often, uh, it's not always the case uh, that we see that this uniform pricing rule actually works. So this is, uh, um, we see that there are um, there are some ir irrational bits, uh, irrational bidders that are going into the uniform um, uh, pricing, uh, bidding zero, uh, which is irrational, and uh, the uh, theoretical analysis would not predict this um, because it, in, in its nature, is a little bit um, simplified, um, and. Uh, this, this problem of zero pricing, uh, of course, uh, or zero bids, of course, uh, is, is, is a big issue because, uh, in a way, it undermines the idea uh, that we have with the auctions, uh, where we want to um, give support to those who require it at the level they actually uh, require it. And um, the latest example that we can see is the outcome of the Spanish auction, um, where they have uh, used the uniform pricing rule and uh, the outcome, the strike price, was, uh, was zero uh, overall. And uh, I would have liked to hear uh, Juan's um, comment on this, uh, because he actually predicted uh, some problems with this uh, uh, in our kickoff workshop in June last year, um, uh, talking about uh, kamikaze bidders um, that might uh, 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 emerge uh, in the Spanish market, but uh, maybe we'll have to uh, take that uh, later on. So that was just uh, just an example uh, on the on the on uh, the way we we combine this uh, more theoretical analysis with uh, with the empirical experiences in our project. Um, and then also we have some, of course, some insights from past auction experiences, and um, uh, Fabian has. Uh, uh, mentioned some of them. Overall, you can say that we have uh, some mixed experiences um, where uh, we see that a lot of times uh, low support uh, prices could be achieved, but realization rates are um, usually below 100% where we can already uh, uh, um, uh, come to the conclusion because auctions uh, as, a, as an instrument for renewable uh, support are very new, so often we don't even know uh, the re realization rates uh, of, of the different designs as of yet. And uh, as uh, uh, also Catherine mentioned before, um, finding the appropriate penalty level um, seems to be quite an issue. And um, uh, we can see that especially in the uh, ongoing auction implementations in Europe that we are also following in the project. I just uh, uh, would, to give, would like to give some examples on that. Um, 
what we actually can see is that the developments there are going into uh, uh, quite many different directions. Um, so um, we see uh, auction implementations that are uh, uniform pricing, uh, pay as bid pricing as well. Um, we see different uh, ways of contracting. Um, so we have uh, uh, capacities that are being uh, um, that are being auctioned, as well as um, uh, energy. Uh, the amount of energy which is uh, coming up in the Polish scheme, um, where you where you bid for an amount of energy, not a capacity, um, and then also the uh, the remuneration scheme uh, are. I think there are more similarities. Uh, um, so um, we we also see that uh, some some um, some of the um, design options are um, maybe a bit converging. You could say, um, for example. Uh, a lot of the auction schemes use uh, contract for differences. Um, not all. We see in the Spanish case that was an auction for an uh, investment grant, but a lot, a lot of countries actually start applying contract for differences. Uh, we see that in, in the UK, in Germany, uh, uh, Denmark, also some of the new, uh, newer developments like Poland. Um, and a lot of these are actually also uh, specific for technologies, um, or they, they are quotas for uh, quotas or different uh, different um, uh, bid uh, maximum price levels for different technologies. So a pure technology neutral auction is actually very rare to see. Um, another thing that we see is that uh, we do have mostly uh, multi-unit auctions. Um, uh, single unit auctions are actually, um, as far as I see, mostly used for offshore wind, not so much other uh, other technologies. And um, and uh, when we look at offshore wind, actually what we can see is also that uh, this is a, a nice example of uh, uh, different countries learning from each other. So Denmark has done uh, offshore auctions since 2004. And uh, their way of doing uh, auctions, they have, of course, uh, along the way learned and improved the scheme. Um, and uh, now their way of doing the auctions is becoming um, more and more popular in the other countries. For example, uh, uh, Germany is now uh, talking about implementing many of the features uh, of the Danish auction scheme, uh, as well as the Netherlands. So, um, so there are some uh, some elements of uh, of. Uh, uh, of uh, this joint learning, which is of course also one of the major targets of, uh, of the Aorus project. Um, also, again, uh, when we look at the uh, when we look at the Croatian uh, scheme, for example, um, they are currently drafting uh, their their first auction. They have just uh, entered the European Union, and the whole energy system, of course, is uh, is. Uh, in under restructuring, uh, but they're also going to uh, implement some auctions. And they have actually used uh, the German uh, scheme quite a lot as a, as a blueprint. Um, they have added some other features, but uh, there are some uh, some elements that uh, that uh, come across. And um, um, I think that was the, the last point uh, I wanted to say about the uh, about the insights that we have. Um, maybe more in general, um, you can say that um, I just wanted to um, mention the uh, gen some general benefits and challenges that we have on the auctions that we see. Um, and these are um, the benefits. I think uh, why we want to do the auctions at all is that, of course, there is price competition among the bidders, which. Uh, which is uh, which is a good thing. <laughs> it can be a good thing. Then there is um, uh, there is this case that the support levels now uh, in the auction are uh, flexibly determined by the market rather than the, uh, the policymaker, which can be a, can be an advantage. Uh, and then of course the volume and budget control um, of the support payments, which is um, uh, which is uh, I think favored by many policymakers nowadays. But of course, then there is the risk of uh, underfulfilling uh, the targets if the realization rates are low. And we have seen uh, that there, it, it is, it can be quite uh, difficult to hit the balance, uh, the right balance between uh, between um, uh, efficiency and uh, achieving a higher realization rate. Um, then uh, higher risk in auctions. I think that's what uh, what Catherine also already mentioned. It actually it favors larger players, and we have to deal with that. Uh, it also may increase costs for the development um, 
uh, we just need to acknowledge this as well. And then, of course, we have this risk of unfavorable strategic bidding, bidding behavior or irrational bidding behavior, and we have seen that in real life, and it can actually uh, impede the, uh, the outcome of the auction can hamper our, uh, uh, the, the success of, of the scheme uh, in quite a, uh, a severe way. So, so we have to be very careful with that. And uh, um, from, from overall, what I see is that uh, in order to, uh, uh, to benefit from, from the positive side and to avoid the challenges, uh, the disadvantages of auctions, you really have to uh, tailor the auction scheme to a specific market situation. So there is no uh, one size fits all uh, uh, in this uh, in the situation. So, um, and this is what we are going to work more on for the next uh, two years in the project. Great, thank you. Well, uh, we will have to do with our grant today, I'm afraid. But uh, before we move on to the, uh, to some questions from the other participants. Uh, I would like to give you and the panel a, a chance to put some brief comments to what have been said so, so far, uh, if, if you have any. Then go ahead. Sorry. It, no, I mean, I think, what, you know, listening to this, I, I think that, um, you know, if I was an outsider, I didn't know what was going on here, I would think, ooh, Auctions sound incredibly complex, actually, and uh, I think that they are complex relative to what was the kind of the classic feed-in. And I think that my main message to anybody who is listening to this is to think, um, as Lena just said, that um, supporting a renewable industry is going to be very different in very different countries. And Denmark and Germany, which are the, you know, the two countries, as a, you know, as a Brit, I can say this, are the two countries that are really doing best, really, in terms of um, renewable development. The kind of situations that apply in Denmark and Germany are completely different from the situations that apply in um, many other countries, not just in Europe, but elsewhere. And so the, the kind of decision makers in those other countries really have to think, you know, does it suit the situation where, uh, to have a kind of a risky mechanism or does it suit the situation to have an almost uh, risk-free situation, uh, in which case you would not have um, auctions. And, and, and that would be my big, big kind of takeaway for people who are, Kind of thinking, well, what what should we do? So they may be good in situations where countries are moving on, but I think that they are so complex compared to fits in a situation where, you, you know, having renewables is not just about paying the subsidy. It is also about the enabling environment around the renewables. So it's markets and networks and laws and planning and all these things. And it... It, that sort of stuff takes time to develop and um, just kind of launching into an auction at the same time, I think, has a very different effect on the development of that enabling <laughs> auction. And, and Britain, way back in 1990, you know, obviously now completely out of date, <laughs> but nevertheless, you know, the British situation back in 1990 is a very good example of a country starting out with an auction, which was a disaster. Maybe um, commenting uh, Catherine's point, yeah, I agree that somehow auctions are more complex and um, one of the best ways to deal with it is maybe also not to introduce them all at once, but step by step. I mean, pilot auctions usually can give actors, can give parts industry an opportunity to learn already. It can be happened in a smaller, rather controlled uh, part. And then based on that also the auction design can be adapted and, and um, adaptations can be made. So I think it's important that maybe not to, to, to do it all at once, but really to do it uh, step by step and um, adapt the scheme where necessary. Um, so that, that could be a way to do it. And then in the end, I mean, talking about this, this kind of card play, um, bid us um, that, that can be zero prices or too low prices in, in uniform pricing schemes. Um, I mean, there are some schemes that, that help also um, that kind of protect 
the bidders from themselves by by asking for very high for, for higher project development, for example, to ensure that actually bidders are always bidding the three projects. Um, so that would be an option. On the other, another option is to to simply continue to to inform and and and, and train potential bidders, um, because in the end the participation itself should not be too complex. But of course, bidders who are rather unexperienced so far with participating in auctions, they will need some help in the beginning, and and um, this they will need to be further informed. Maybe one more comment from my side. I can really uh, only uh, yeah. Uh, add and to, to what Catherine and uh, Fabian said, and really emphasize that this is really uh, these are key elements, and that these, uh, uh, markets and developing markets and industry is far more complex than just implementing an auction. And um, therefore, I think it is important that a certain diversity of actors and a certain development of and maturity of the market is existing in order to implement a, a successful auction, in order to have a really competition in the market and uh, in order to have a liquid uh, yeah, situation uh, which then leads to uh, reasonable prices and also um, to the uh, effectiveness. And, um, in that sense, um, I would like to really emphasize the fact that also the auctioner should have a good knowledge of the market and of the uh, possibly offered volumes within the market in order to evaluate the scarcity in the market and the potential uh, competition level. And um, this is uh, probably also one reason, and here I would uh, like to come back to what Lena said, that technology neutrality is so rarely chosen as an auction design in, um, in, in Europe and also in other uh, countries, because uh, even though technology neutrality seems to uh, or sounds simpler at the first uh, glance, it is actually more complicated because you have to control and to understand many different technology markets at once in order to see whether you have com com competition and scarcity and whether you will get to competitive prices and good results. And I think this is really one important result of, of the empirical, uh, empirical assessments we have uh, done so far in the, in the ORS project that uh, technology neutrality might not be the easiest answer for further development of auctioning schemes. And, uh, last but not least, since we have dealt a lot with offshore auctioning in uh, Germany and the design of these auctions, uh, one can really see that uh, studying the uh, Danish experiences and the Dutch experiences, that uh, the market knowledge and also the consultation with market actors uh, is a very important uh, element in order to design uh, good auction schemes and to order to get uh, yeah, good results in terms of uh, effectiveness and um, efficiency, and that also shows that, uh, that that market players need to be existing, and uh, the regulator should have a reasonable understanding and also uh, complementary instruments are important. Okay, great, thanks. Now we actually have uh, Juan Vivia with us from uh, the Spanish utility Padola. And uh, one, uh, I hope it's not uh, on our account that you are <laughs> late. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, now we have you here, and uh, that's really great. Um, I would like to. Uh, I'm sorry for my delay. No problem. Uh, I would like to hear about your experiences as uh, a utility and your recommendations for other utilities working with. Uh, tenders and auctions uh, for the first time, uh, and maybe a few words about the uh, Kamakashi uh, auctions that uh, Lena told us about uh, before. If you could uh, give us a brief introduction to that. Yes, of course. Well, first of all, I'm sorry if I repeat anything that has already been said. Uh, I haven't heard everything that has been uh, said by other panelists. Um, okay, my experience with Petrola in uh, tenders uh, is limited uh, this far. I mean, I think there are there have been some awful results in some places and some others that are reasonably 
uh, good. I think it's something that is really here to to stay somehow because it's uh, it's amazing how widespread tendering has become everywhere. Uh, but it is also true that there are some characteristics that uh, auctions have to have to, um, to to go through something successful. And uh, for example, uh, I am sure that the most experience, uh, the more the most recent experiences have been in Spanish, uh, the Spanish uh, auction, but we've seen how uh, somebody with, uh, well, two brothers actually, uh, that didn't belong to the uh, wind sector, have won 80% of the 500 megawatts that were auctioned in, in Spain. And they, they won these, uh, these 80% with uh, uh, a bid which was I, I don't think they even knew what they were doing afterwards by some declaration they made, where they uh, really said that they did a 100% reduction of, uh, on their topic somehow. What does it mean? I mean, it means that the people who have won this auction have ended up with uh, new obligations. Now they have uh, uh, time limits to put into operation their wind farms. So between uh, they have four years to put into operation uh, the wind farms, the megawatts we have uh, they have wind, and um, and if they don't do that, they're gonna lose uh, 20 euros per kilowatt of uh, liability to the ground, yeah. uh, which is not much, but it's something more than nothing, and uh, they have earned nothing. They have. No, nothing they, when they come out of their auction, they just have nothing more than they had before at the production. Yeah, they, they could have developed their wind farms in the market. I don't have any support anyhow, not even a floor. I think those people thought that um, they, they were winning some sort of a floor at the market, at the current market level, but they are not. So what, why this has happened? I think there has been uh, several issues here, and uh, the mess, uh, well, one of them is that, as anybody knows in Spain, it was a backlog. Uh, we had a moratorium four years ago, and all the developers had a huge amount of uh, megawatts, just some of them with standard cost, uh, a lot of special specific circumstances that they were eager to go out, uh, to go uh, further. And, and actually they had, I mean, the one that survived, the one the pipeline that survived was really extremely good uh, sites and wind farms. So, and besides that, with all, all, all this backlog, uh, what was announced was just one single auction of 500 megawatts. We have to take in, to keep in mind that at the moment of the moratorium, Spain was spending more or less two gigawatts per year. So it's just like something like uh, eight, ten gigawatts of backlog there. In the usual circumstances, and we want just one single option for oh, 500 megawatts, and no, no vision of any, uh, any, any continuity of uh, some more options. So nobody had visibility looking forward of other possibilities. So we want just this occasion for none. That's very important also because everybody had just had, had all these. So it was just this possibility, and no one. No one else. Um, and also, the other reason was that to participate in the auction, uh, you could do that. Anybody could do that. You just had these 20 euros per kilowatt uh, like this to put forward, and that's all. You didn't have to, uh, to say, um, to justify how good you were in, your, um, in terms of uh, as a wind developer or anything to do with uh, the project itself. So you just presented generic megawatts. So I mean, you're gonna say, I mean, I'm gonna present 100 megawatts, and then you can fulfill your obligation with whatever you want. Uh, you want it. So what happened is just basically, uh, well, the, out of these 500 megawatts, 100 more or less was won by UDP, which is a serious player. And their, their reasons were that they never thought it was going to close that low, and uh, they wanted to just uh, uh, have this. Uh, we had megawatts, so we're going to build them anyway. So it was just like, a, okay, whatever I have here, it is better than nothing. But the other 400 was people that basically it's a company that uh, deals with pigs, 
to make ham. Uh, so then that shows that I'm going to have to the wind and uh, they have uh, uh, and they have made this bed with 400, so they knew there was a high possibility of closing at this level. It doesn't make sense, really. I think there was a lack of understanding of what were the rules. And actually, they, they, I don't think they had any those 400 megawatts <laughs> available. So they just presented megawatts, and now uh, they have to develop them, which doesn't make sense again. So I, I think I think this is. Um, it's an example of, of how, in some, several mistakes that were done here, first of all, the prerequisites for us as Libertola, I think it is crucial to uh, have some citizens because, again, tenders have a very, uh, I would say the main issue with tenders is that it takes really a long time to correct the results. From the moment you assign the uh, results to the moment you know there is a problem because it's not going to be built or whatever, it can take years. Even in some cases, as I say, there's always like the two negative parts of participants are speculators, just gone there to win and just to sell things. That's something that is usually easier to deal with. And then um, the other one is the kamikazes that we have here, just people that are good willing people that think they can do things. And those are much more dangerous than, than speculators because they, they go there, they don't know exactly what they're doing, and they get busted the, the, the auction for the sector. And uh, afterwards, I've even seen that in, in Brazil, for example, where you have people that really go there that they didn't really know what were the real costs of operating a wind farm or anything. So they just go there and they actually build the wind farm. So they're really good wind people, but then they go bankrupt because they cannot. The, uh, the, uh, the depth and everything because it, they just didn't have a her uh, uh, um, business plan. And so it's very important that in the pre prerequisites of any wind farm, it's just to be as transparent as possible, uh, to be as uh, uh, and to provide uh, the prerequisite has to somehow feature, um, use as a feature to professionalism uh, and also make sure that the mega what are represented are something that exists, uh, that are there. And also because also it helps a lot to say, to console how these megawatts evolve. So you can react much quicker. Okay, those megawatts are those ones. You have an issue here and you're not gonna be begin to be built or whatever, then you can react quicker to say, okay, those ones are just the one that is not gonna be built. Because we know that it's not gonna be in time. If, it, if they are generic, who knows? You can come out with somebody. Oh, I'm looking here and looking there. It has to be very um, something very concrete, very, very specific. Um, so that, that's the bad part of tenders. <laughs> okay. Uh, the, the good part of tenders. Uh, that's uh, why, for me, the draw. I would think that it is not. I mean, um, very well designed tender uh, should work. I mean, it's a huge. A structure, a render structure, we, we call that a, an amazing render structure from, from the, the promoters. All the, all the margins are just squeezed out. But actually, we, we can work with that. I mean, we, we, don't, we are, as a controller, we are a long term player. So we don't, we don't mind having a reasonable rate of return. We don't want to make a very quick money and a lot of money on things. So we don't mind doing something very reasonable. Looking long term, we just long term players. So we don't mind about that. But, uh, but it's very important to, when, uh, when you do that, um, I mean, the reason why we also like somehow the tenders is because we hope, we hope as a long term player that if you win some incentive, some support mechanism to a tender mechanism, it's going to be much harder for any regulator. To do retroactive changes to your income because you have won this right to a competitive tender. I mean, it, it's very hard to really say that there, are, there is any kind of overcompensation there. Um, and so we hope, we hope that uh, well, in some countries maybe you don't need this kind of security. 
Well, I think there's a lot of countries, I would say most of them, <laughs> um, when the crisis comes and when issues comes, uh, I hope that having uh, one uh, a support mechanism to a thunder will protect the investors' uh, confidence uh, and the investors' uh, support mechanism from any region or any of the region. So that, that, I would say that's the main reason why we accept all the difficulties that are that goes along with these tenders. Because tenders we have to realize that tenders is, is a I would say it's a render structure and it's also very risky because you have to for tenders to work, you need to promote and to spend money in uh, development that you know that not all of it we go through because in a tender you always need to have something that is left outside. So it's risky in terms of development cost pre-auction and then you have all the risk post-auction because you have liability so it's, as a developer it's riskier and it's uh, and actually you, you, your margins are really reduced at the minimum expression. That would be my uh, I hope the uh, interesting for everybody who is uh, the, the panel. I'm sorry if I have repeated anything that hasn't been said before. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think we'll move on to the uh, participants and invite you to uh, see if you can uh, raise your hand in the system and uh, post any comments or questions to the panelists. Um, if you cannot do that, you're welcome to write comments or questions in the uh, chat and we will uh, try to answer them there. Uh, I can see there's a question from Craig Morris in the chat <laughs> for all panelists. I uh, don't know if you see it and uh, Maybe we should uh, read it aloud. Uh, it says auctions are generally talked about in terms of reducing costs, but in fact they are principally a policy designed to give governments uh, utilities a way of controlling the growth of renewables. In fact, the thing that auctions unequivocally do well is prevent a market from growing faster than the amount in, on auction. If we agree that the wish for greater control of this growth is justifiable, such as for grid planning, how can such steering be enabled without auctions, such as feed and tariffs? Uh, any, anyone in the panel who would like to take a go for that? No, I don't. I don't know. Catherine? Oh, she got that. Okay. No, I mean I, I agree with Craig there. So um, I'm. I'll open it to. Okay. Yeah. I mean, uh, I think the, uh, volume control has been attempted also in other support schemes. Uh, like for example, in uh, one famous case is the German PV example, where we had a volume target of 1.5 gigawatt per year and where we actually reach a market development up to nine gigawatt per year, uh, where uh, the uh, volume control attempted was the so-called breathing lid, or so was the, the ceiling, uh, or the, the depend dependence of the feed-in tariff on uh, market development, where an overshooting market development led to a reduction of the feed-in tariff. But uh, the, the problem with those, uh, types of volume controls is that the time delayed feedback leads to long term uh, feedback effects which uh, make volume control relatively difficult. Um, and so the alternative would be to have uh, a feed in tariff combined with a maximum uh, ceiling of uh, installed capacity, but then you have essentially a first come, first serve rule if you don't do that with an auction. And um, here I would say that an auction is the, actually the better system than uh, first come first serve because it's less 
uh, a bribery and has um, it brings the economic uh, logic of uh, maximizing efficiency into the uh, into the mechanism. Exactly. Maybe just to add, I mean, we can see one of the first come first shot schemes in Austria we implemented in the case of PV. And these schemes can really then lead to quite a strong boom and bust uh, phase where you actually, if, if the, the cap is too, too high, if, 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 if too much is being built at once, then you have, I don't know, a have a gigawatt of plants being registered um, and then nothing at all anymore. So I think it's really like a way also to, like, to, to portion it in smaller parts into auction as a way to also protect the, the industry in a way from boom and bust circles and give more pl actually planning uh, and certainty to the investors who who will then in the end can still at least steer whether they will be considered for support or not. And um, also from a point of view of what I said before, uh, that we hope that uh, winning our support through a tenant scheme will protect us from regulatory changes. One very important side from this mention uh, also is that you go to the auction, you control the volume, of course, which is what we said here, and also it's uh, it's also it's very important, although it's, uh, it's on our our cost, um, to really make renewables as competitive as possible, and to be good, not, it's not only the volume, it's only the cost of volume. If you get there, it's just some sort of a guarantee that you're going to have. Uh, a bigger amount of megawatts for the buck. <laughs> okay. Uh, and that's what we've seen is, is also one of the, I mean, of course, in Spain we had the, uh, this crisis, uh, general crisis, but also in terms of, uh, in terms of, uh, of renewables, we had the bubbles in, uh, in solar, uh, in Spain, you know, where it was a big, big question of volume and a big question of price. Uh, actually, both go together. If you pay, if the feeding tariff that is put there is too high, then you're going to have a bubble. Uh, that's what happened in Spain. So we ended up with a big, big, you know, bow <laughs> there that we have to pay in the next 25 years. Uh, and it, it, it dry and, and all these, but not only because of that, but partly because of that, drove all those situations changes in Spain, which is like a bubble. It, uh, we had a backlash uh, about all these issues. But it's also very important to have this security, to give the regulators the security that what they are paying here is really what they need to be paid uh, somehow. Maybe yeah. just to, um, sorry, <laughs> maybe just to uh, just comment uh, on Fabian's uh, uh, remark regarding the, uh, the boom and bust cycles. I think we ha what we have to keep in mind is that the auction itself uh, creates cycles, and this is also a, an important part of the uh, of the design of the auction that you that you uh, think or that the policymakers think very carefully about priorities uh, as the, uh, the quick frequency of the auction. So if it's uh, done less than once a year, for example, then also you could create a backlog log of projects. So uh, in that sense, it's not so much different from a, a first come first serve. Um, that's a, maybe a little bit radical uh, view, but uh, I think uh, we need to uh, think that into into the design of the auction that we do them often enough uh, that uh, we actually avoid these uh, these backlogs of, uh, of projects and to create a continuous uh, a growth and continuous uh, um, activity in the industry. And I imagine that Craig, you know, one of the re one of Craig's points there is that. Um, He's saying, uh, which you know is absolutely true, and it was certainly the case of Britain back back early on, that uh, auctions are just great ways to maximise the spend from government on renewables. But if uh, the renewables policy is part of a bigger energy and climate policy in order to reduce emissions to a certain degree, then there will be an amount of renewables that are needed in order to meet whatever the country has signed up to. And often the renewable targets and the caps are not uh, equivalent to that. And therefore, auctions are a way really to allow uh, governments not to spend as much money as they would like to, possibly because they don't have the money uh, on renewables. And 
you know, there, there is, there's, you know, this is where kind of energy policy gets into much kind of bigger kind of questions of politics and what the, what, um, what, what, you know, the ability of the government to control its environmental policy to meet its wider, wider goals. And definitely within, you know, in that sense, auctions is something which allows countries which are not so progressive uh, to have more control over doing that. So I think if that is where Craig is coming from, then I, I also understand what he's saying. Yeah, and I think we have to be mentioned that it's, it's, I mean, it will not necessarily reduce uh, uh, the mm -hmm. amount of, of energy policy, it can also actually increase it. I mean, we have in, in Germany, for example, the biomass industry is actively asking for the introduction of an auction scheme, particularly because they say that our current tariffs are too low, our current supreme tariffs are too low, and we would really actually like to get access to the support scheme to ensure that the amount of, of megawatt that that's uh, mentioned in, in the annual uh, build-up target is actually being achieved. And for that, we need higher tariffs, and we can believe that the higher tariffs can only be achieved through an auction scheme, because the auction scheme would then set these higher targets. Um, so so I, I think I totally agree with that, and I wouldn't in any way kind of criticize Germany, which, you know, as far as I'm concerned, is completely perfect. I just think that, um, or nearly perfect, um, I just think that there are many countries who which are not um, Germany and which are not Denmark, and, and, and you have to, you know, expect that things, that some countries just, the, the governments of some countries just do not want to develop renewables and energy efficiency, uh, even though they may have signed up to it within the European Commission. And in that situation, um, you know, one, 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 one should expect the worst to happen. And therefore, the design of the mechanisms, um, I think it's easier for a country to, set, to have poor auction design than a, a kind of a more a simpler sort of feed-in design if the country in question doesn't really want to do it or spend money, which sadly, I think, is the case in some countries. Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much. Excellent and very interesting discussion. I will uh, ask Lena now to uh, wrap up the debate with uh, comments on interesting points and uh, relevant issues for, for the coming phases of the uh, AWIS project. Um, I can't see any more raised hands or questions in the chat, so go ahead, Lena. Thank you, Michael. Um, uh, I tried to do that really short because it's already past 12 and uh, I've wrote, written down a whole page of interesting things <laughs> that we will take. But I think uh, um, just the, the maybe three import, most important things that uh, uh, we, we will, uh, uh, or, um, I have uh, uh, noted down is very important that uh, in the design of the auction to understand the local market conditions. Um, and to learn from the experiences of others uh, that uh, what we are actually doing. Um, and then the other thing is to make the design as simple as possible. Um, I think that is an, uh, that's a challenge. Um, and what does it mean uh, to make it as simple as possible, for example, um, by uh, still protecting small actors, um, um, by considering um, uh, um, different issues, different uh, multiple policy objectives, for example. So, so that is an issue that we are definitely going to work on uh, um, uh, later on. And um, yeah, um, I think the, the last point maybe I just wanted to uh, to mention is we sh we, that uh, what Catherine uh, started out with in the very beginning that we should uh, keep in mind that um, we are talking about uh, we're talking about the energy transition as a whole um, in many countries, and they are much. This is much larger than auctions. Um, it is uh, uh, only renewable, uh, larger than only renewable support. There's a lot of uh, different actors involved, and uh, 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 by nature uh, broader than uh, than only what we can favor as winners in the auction. So I think we should also maybe keep that in mind when uh, when we uh, design the auction, how this feeds into the overall uh, energy transition that might be going on in, uh, in many countries. Okay, thank you. Uh, 
Well, and uh, thank you, Lima, and thanks all of the participants and uh, the panelists. At least uh, very interesting discussion, as I said, and uh, we will wrap it all up on the uh, website at uh, ourwestproject.eu, and uh, maybe there's a uh, basis for an article that wraps this discussion up uh, also. So let's see. But uh, keep in touch with us at the website and uh, get the latest news there and watch a recording of this uh, debate uh, in, uh, in some time. Uh, well, thank you, everyone. I will close the debate now. Bye. 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 Bye.